On behalf of the officers and the Board of Trustees of the Aerospace Education Foundation and the Air Force Association, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Foundation's fourth annual salute during which we honor a true American hero. He's holder of the Medal of Honor. He's the first president of our Air Force Association with his beautiful bride of 66 years, whom he met in 1910, our beloved General Jimmy Doolittle and his wife, Joe. General, we honor you tonight. And ladies and gentlemen, while your hearts and minds are filled with Doolittles, let me welcome and introduce to you their son and their daughter-in-law, retired Air Force Colonel John Doolittle and his wife Priscilla, right over here. John, Priscilla, welcome. Now, while you're having your coffee, I want to introduce uh, to this audience a distinguished group of uh, uh, people that are very special, guests of Senator Goldwater and our foundation. There are five groups. I'm going to introduce them individually and then ask them to rise as a group for your recognition and for your applause. The first of these groups consists of five women, very special women, each with a special niche in our aerospace heritage. First, uh, her name is synonymous with roller bearings and castings. She's an aviatrix, a left seat jet pilot in her own right, a friend of the Air Force from top to bottom, and that's Louise Timken, and I'm going to ask you to stay still, Louise. I'll get you up in a minute. And then the widow of a former Air Force Chief of Staff, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and very close friend of all of ours is Mrs. George Skip Brown. And Skip, stay down. The wife of a Congressional Medal winner, a legendary wartime commander of American and Allied Airmen, whose name we honor with one of our special fellowships in our foundation, and that's Mrs. Ira C. Ruth Aker. And Ruth, stay down. And then the widow of our first chief of staff of the Air Force, whose cavalry father, Colonel Harrison, said to his wife one day, Honey, I see Ruth keeping company with that Lieutenant Spots. I want that to stop immediately because today I found out from the adjutant he'd put in for aviation training, and there's absolutely no future in that. And today we have Ruth Spots, the wife of our first chief of staff. And then our final lady that I want to introduce in this group, a globe-trotting war correspondent in World War II, ambassador to Italy. She was role model for Ethel Mormon, Merman in uh, uh, the lady ambassador role in Call Me Madam. She was a contributor to Air Force magazine. She wrote a beautiful article, How to Deal with the Russians. And she says, just don't forget they're different and they come from a different system and she's been a member of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, and that's the Honorable Claire Booth Luce. And will all five of those lovely ladies please stand up and let us recognize them. <laughs> and now I've got a group I want to recognize because they made possible what we're doing tonight with the President and Mrs. Reagan. Uh, they are representative uh, uh, of all the earlier corporate fellows of our Ira Aker and Jimmy Doolittle fellowships. Uh, these are the people who in prior years have been invested as corporate fellows uh, of our foundation. The Northrop Corp Corporation is represented tonight by Stan Ebner, and Stan, you stay down. And the Corporate Vice President of Government Relations represents General Dynamics tonight, and that's Ed Lefevre. And the Vice Chairman of the Board of Mutual of Omaha is here tonight, and that's Tom Scutt, and he's with us, representing VJ. And uh, the president of Martin Marietta is represented here tonight, uh, Mr. Caleb K.B. Hurt, uh, their president. The Boeing is uh, represented by Vice President Boris Michel. The Garrett Corporation has Mr. Bruce Arnold, the son of uh, the legendary General, General Hap Arnold, the founder of our association. The vice president of Fairchild Industry is here, Mr. Hal Howes and the Vice President of McDonnell Douglas Corporation, Mr. J.C. Crosswaith. Uh, the Hughes Aircraft is represented by its chairman, Alan Puckett. The President and Chief Operating Officer of Rockwell International, Mr. Donald Beale, is among our guests. 
And the representative of Textron's Bell Helicopter Company, Mr. Jack Dahl, is here. The vice president of Lockheed Corporation, Mr. Richard Cook, who represents his company as one of our corporate fellows. The president of Ford Aerospace and Communications Corporation, Mr. Henry uh, Hockheimer, is here with us, as is the Laurel vice president, Mr. Rick DeSasso, the chairman of uh, the Vice Chairman of American Telephone and Telegraph Company, Mr. James E. Olson, is among our guests. The Vice President of Government Affairs of Hughes Helicopters, Washington office, Mr. Stan Kimmett. And the MITRE Corporation is represented by its Executive Vice President, Mr. Charlie Zrakett. And the President of Government Products Division of Pratt & Whitney, Frank McAbee, is here. These are our corporate fellows who have been invested in prior years and would you gentlemen representing those corporate fellows please stand and be honored by all of us for what you've done to support our foundation. Thank you. The third group is smaller, possibly less affluent, but is important uh, to all of us tonight, for they are the ones we really honor. I'd like for you to listen to these three names as representative of the worldwide civilian and military leadership of the Air Force. Let me mention all three and then let them stand and be honored. First, the senior uniformed Air Force officer on active duty, the man we all voted for to be chief of staff. Nobody took our votes, but that's who we would have voted for, uh, General Charles A. Gabriel. And the Air Force Secretary Vern Orr couldn't be with us tonight. We've got the Undersecretary of the Air Force, the first one from Texas A&M to make it, the Honorable Edward C. Pete Aldrich, and the recently appointed Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Sam Parrish. These, this is the leadership of the Air Force, ladies and gentlemen. Charlie and Pete, Sam, through you, we want to recognize the entire United States Air Force, active, retired, Air National Guard, reserve forces, active forces, all of those who make up our United States total Air Force, and we are very proud of it. Now to acknowledge uh, with appreciation and respect, two of the most Im uh, important and influential uh, members of Congress for us, the Honorable Melvin Price, Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Democrat from the 21st Dictri District of Illinois, and Mrs. Price. She didn't get up, but we're glad to have you here tonight, too. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have you to meet the four elected officers of the United States Air Force Association, the parent organization of our foundation. I'll introduce the four of them and then ask them to stand and be recognized. Our national treasurer from Do Dover, Delaware, Mr. George Chabot, the Air Force Association's national secretary from Bellevue, Washington, Mr. Sherm Wilkins, the chairman of the board, retired Major General from Pennsylvania Air National Guard, now judge of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, Judge John Broski, and the president of the Air Force Association, from Tulsa, Oklahoma, Mr. David Blankenship. This is our national leadership. We have two of the national of, uh, trustees of uh, our foundation present tonight, a former president and chairman of the board of the Air Force Association. He's now the treasurer of the Aerospace Education Foundation from College Heights Estates in Maryland, Mr. George Hardy, and the president of our foundation, and now president of the Tri-County Technical College in South Carolina, Dr. Don Garrison. And now, Don, if you'll spell me here, there's one more national officer of our foundation, but I'll leave that uh, introduction to you, Don. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Don Garrison. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Ladies and gentlemen, the Aerospace Education Foundation is honored to continue our annual tradition of saluting General Doolittle and honoring through him a series of great Americans. We promised a short program this evening, and we will fulfill this promise. I would be remiss, however, if I did not take this opportunity to say just a few words about the Aerospace Education Foundation. It has been called the conscious of the parent organization, the Air Force Association. And I think that this is an apt description. The work of the foundation is detailed in your program, so I think it will be suffice to say that 
Through our activities, we carry out the mandate of the association to spread the word about aerospace, its people, its technology, its potential, both for our security and to serve the needs of all mankind in this explosive era of high technology. Over and above that, we in the foundation are striving to build a foundation of respect for the history of aerospace advances in concept, in technology, and in achievement. We want to capture and to preserve for successor generations the rich, exciting heritage of those who follow the high roads of aerospace achievements. As have been mentioned, we are a non-endowed foundation, and our work is made possible through the generosity of sponsors of many of our programs. And two such programs are highlighted tonight, the Jimmy Doolittle Education Fellowship and the Ira Aker Historical Fellowships. We recognize tonight and extend our appreciation to, the, to those 1983 corporate fellows of the Jimmy Doolittle Fellowship Program. First, the AFCO Corporation, an important diversified operating company which shares great and continuing responsibility for the vigor and the productivity of our aerospace industry. So please welcome with me the Corporate Vice President of the Washington Office of the AFCO Corporation, Mr. John B. Kelly. John. And now we honor the next corporate fellow, the Link Flight Simulation Division of the Singer Company, which carries on the pioneering tradition and the valuable flight training role of the World War II Link Trainer. Please welcome the Vice President for Government Relations of the Link Flight Simulation Division of the Singer Company, Mr. Austin Watson. Austin, thank you. I also want to mention the investiture of two other 1983 corporate fellows of our foundation whose representatives could not be with us tonight. First, the Reader's Digest Foundation. As part of one of our nation's and the world's, indeed, largest and most respected publishing companies whose influence and prestige is brought to bear on the entire human experience. And second, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation that is deeply involved in supporting a range of the major scientific, educational, and humanistic programs ongoing in our nation. Once again, we thank these latest corporations who have joined us this year as corporate fellows in the Doolittle Educational Fellowship Program. And again, our thanks to all of the corporate fellows who've been invested and recognized in earlier years and they're all listed in your program, and they're varied, and they're many, and they're great to our foundation. Now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the chairman of the board of our aerospace education. Our chairman has served in this volunteer capacity for eight years. He does this because he's truly dedicated to the work of our foundation. And on our part, we can't think of a better representative of all that we stand for as a foundation as the Air Force Association, and as patriotic citizens of this great nation. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a distinguished active aviator, an international statesman of the first magnitude, and a senior statesman from Arizona, our chairman of the board, and your host tonight, Senator Barry Goldwater. <laughs> Senator Goldwater. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Don. I liked all about that introduction, but senior. <laughs> but I guess it's true you can't duck it. This is a hell of a thing up here. Must be made by some airplane company I know. Uh, thank you, Don. I welcome all of you to this annual get-together at which the Foundation salutes aerospace heroes and honors those who have done much to assure the continuation of our work. 
But before we get on with that work, uh, I have a little something to say. Mr. President and Mrs. Reagan and all of you wonderful people, about this time in the program, my boss, General Doherty, usually puts a nicely written speech in my hands. But this year, I, I did my own. Now, I can remember, Mr. President, when you wouldn't fly. During my cliffhanger election 20 years ago, uh, we, would, uh, we would ask him to make a speech for me, uh, say, in Miami, Florida. Of course, he would say yes. Then he'd get on a train in Los Angeles and go to Miami and do the job. And now, though, I have the very distinct feeling that he's grown to like Air Force One. It's safe, it's comfortable, and they really feed well. <laughs> now, my words tonight will be for the President, but every one of you will be flying on his wing. Mr. President, this magnificent museum is a hallowed place for me. Often, I walk through it when it is closed and no one else is around. And then I can feel everything in here. I can feel the very spirit of America. And believe me, that feeling is not wrapped up in the historic machines we see around us, not even in General Doolittle's little racer over there, in Howard Hughes' beautiful job at the other end of the building, or in the DC-3 hanging there. It was hanging there. I think it's someplace else, or Eastern settled the strike, one of the two. <laughs> the feeling has just as much to do with the vision that made all of this possible. It has to do with the people who reached beyond the accumulation of human knowledge and opened an entirely new vista for mankind. I think of the Wright brothers and how what they started has changed the size of our world and how their legacy has changed the way we live. Yes, we honor the Lindberghs, the Wrights, the Doolittles, the Akers as heroes, and I think of them with great reverence and even awe. I think also of others who, in another sense, have helped to change our world. You know, them, you know some of them yourselves, the men and women who developed these craft, who kept them flying during our days of wars and peace, and who have kept improving them through the years. Many of these were young men. Now they're old or gone. But through the years, they and people like them have added to the greatness of America. And as you well know, Mr. President, that greatness is not wrapped up in these aircraft and spacecraft. It comes from people who feel there is nothing more noble than to serve. And Mr. President, the people that you see here in their blue uniforms tonight did not and do not get their rewards from flying or maintaining these aircraft, nor do the people in their civilian suits, and you are one of them, get their satisfaction from the honors they receive or the heights they attain. They receive their reward from the service they give our country, a service, Mr. President, they will always give. Now, we gather here, as you know, each year to honor two great American generals, Doolittle and Acre, who personify this spirit. And through this pleasant gathering, we contribute to a fund that will encourage young people to become better educated so that years from now, when, as my grandchildren and yours walk through these hallowed halls, there will be new names to remember, to honor, and to respect. Names of people who live for the satisfaction of knowing that there is nothing more productive, more bountiful than service to their God, their country, and their people. That, Mr. President, is what it's all about. And let me remind you that the great, great majority of our countrymen live that feeling. Millions have, millions do, and millions will. Oh, it's true, there are those few selfish people who can find the term service only to themselves, but they are the pathetic few. This museum, then, Mr. President, is not just a place dedicated to airmen, 
Its dedication is to all who work and pray and call themselves with real pride American. damnedest place I've ever been. <laughs> and now for a very special presentation to a very special couple. I would ask General James Doolittle to come up here and join me during the presentation. And I'd like to call to the lectern that very special couple whom we honor tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Ronald Reagan. read it. Oh, on behalf of the Aerospace Foundation, Education Foundation, it's my privilege and honor to invest you in our Doolittle Fellowship and present to each of you a laser engraved plaque attesting to your investiture as a Jimmy Doolittle Fellow. President Reagan, your fellowship has been sponsored by the R Richmond, Virginia chapter of the Air Force Association. And Nancy, yours was sponsored by the men and women of the General Ed Rawlings chapter of the Air Force Association in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We present these fellowships with our love, appreciation, and all that you have meant to our country. Thank you. Now, oh, you can go sit down, Mr. No. President. What? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, we never had many women around here before. Now, uh, now, don't go away, it says here. <laughs> we have some s personal gifts for you also. First, Nancy, as a tribute to the freshness and spirit and color you've brought to the White House, Please accept this bouquet of new Sonia roses from us to you. And President Reagan, as a charter member of the Air Force Association, and you are, as one who was there when it all began, we hope that this gift will have a special meaning for you. It's the history of the Air Force Association written by the former Executive Secretary Mr. Jim Straubel. More than that, however, and because AFA is so interested uh, and intertwined with the story of the development of air power, we think the title Crusade for Air Power aptly sums up what the Air Force Association and our foundation is all about. To us, you are one of the crusaders who made it all possible. And we thought you would appreciate this leather-bound collector's uh, edition of Jim's book. You'll see that it has been inscribed to you and signed personally by every living former chief of staff and secretary of the Air Force, by Jimmy Doolittle in his foreword, and by Jim Straubel, the author. Please accept it with our appreciation to you for all that you have meant to our country. I know the President and Nancy can sit down, but General Doolittle, I don't know about you. I guess it's all right. You need the exercise anyway. She said I'd come back. Yeah, we'll get you back. Uh, Mr. President, no more could be said than that, and we thank you. Uh, well, this is making well anyway, we thank you. And just to show you what kind of a group you've joined tonight, I'm going to ask them to stand along with all the others in this room who have previously have been designated as in, an individual or corporate Jimmy Doolittle or Ira Aker Fellow, or those who have sponsored such fellowships. For others, with all of you, please stand. 
Everybody who's ever been nicked for a nickel on me. Everybody give them a big hand. I'll just say that this shows the extent of support there is for these worthwhile and productive fellow programs. My thanks go to all of you, and to you, Mrs. Reagan. Uh, Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I express appreciation uh, to, I thought I was reading this wrong. I, I didn't know he got promoted. An appreciation to Colonel Gabriel. Where'd you screw up? <laughs> and the magnificent Air Force Band for the musical support given us tonight. And on behalf of the Aerospace Museum and its director, Mr. Walter J. Boyne, and for, give him a big hand, and for all of us in the Aerospace Education Foundation and in the Air Force Association, we thank you all for coming. And at this point, I would like to, what? Oh, well. <laughs> See, if I didn't have him around, You'd get out of here faster. I, uh, it doesn't, well, anyway, Mr. Fred, would you like to say a few words? I haven't had as much trouble getting on as, since I did a picture, <laughs> since I did a picture with Errol Flynn. <laughs> I, but I thank you. And I just wanted to say that I'm honored to accept the Jimmy Doolittle Fellowship Award to help so many students receive technical and vocational training. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know that all of you feel as I do tonight that it is an honor and a privilege to salute an authentic hero and an American legend. In this country whose history is so rich with wartime valor and genius, only a few events have held a special place in the memory of the American people. Washington's ride across the Delaware, Stonewall Jackson's ride around the Union right and then up to Shenandoah Valley, Douglas MacArthur's brilliant invasion of Inchon, and of course, the courageous and daring raid in 1942 by a handful of Americans led by Jimmy Doolittle. And General, if you'll forgive me, I do have a question I've been wanting to ask you for the last several weeks. How did you get away with not taking any newsmen along? But seriously, General, it is for each one of us here tonight a privilege to be with you, to salute you not only for the heroism of your 30 seconds over Tokyo, but for your service and devotion to our country over a great many years. Many of us have a personal recollection of the hope that you and your men gave the American people in the darkest days of World War II. And if you don't mind me saying so, I also remember serving with you in another of your public-spirited exploits back in 1964, when we worked together for a man who was also an Air Force general, known to many of you in this room, and who is here tonight, Barry Goldwater. I like to think that many of the dreams of a strong America that we had then are coming true today. This is only one more reason why the name Jimmy Doolittle remains an inspiration to me and to the American people. The name was very mentioned, reminds us that no matter how difficult the odds or how great the potential sacrifice, 
A dare for the sake of freedom and our fellow men is a dare well worth taking. So, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in a toast to a magnificent American, a man whose name will be remembered as long as the virtues of valor and patriotism last. Jimmy Doolittle. At this point, I'd like to ask all of you to please remain at your tables while the President and Mrs. Reagan take their leave. I just want to say on behalf of all of us, Mr. President, and to you, Mrs. Reagan, uh, thank you for being here and God bless you and keep you. And to all of you, thank you for being here and if you'll just be patient, these Secret Service men have to exercise. So uh, we'll get with it. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen,